Hello everyone, this is Tom Fox. I'm the Compliance Evangelist and I'd like to welcome you to episode 95 of Compliance Into the Weeds, a podcast where with my good friend and colleague Matt Kelly, founder and editor of Radical Compliance, we take a deep dive literally going into the compliance weeds for a topic each week. Today we look at the recent allegations around Brett Kavanaugh and what that would mean for the compliance practitioner, compliance professional, and a corporate compliance program. We take a look at it through the lens of Matt's most excellent blog post on this, which we will link to in the show notes. Compliance Into the Weeds is a part of the Compliance Podcast Network. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox back again for another episode of Compliance Into the Weeds, a podcast where with my good friend and colleague, Matt Kelly, we take a look at a compliance or compliance related event and literally go into the weeds. Today, we try to unpack the ongoing story with Brett Kavanaugh and the Me Too movement with Christine Blassey Ford. Matt, uh, welcome. And why don't you tell our listeners where you were at this week? Uh, yeah, sure. So, well, physically, I am in Nashville. Uh, so hello to everybody from the Workiva User Conference, anyone who might be in financial compliance or financial planning and analysis or internal auditing. I am uh, physically here this week for their big user conference. It will be Tuesday through Thursday evening. And uh, metaphorically, on the Kavanaugh issue, I am unclear on exactly where I am because this is such a complex and messy case. But I do think that there are probably some valuable points to ponder for compliance officers about Me Too accusations and how how companies need to think about them because they really aren't like other types of misconduct. And so that's where I am, figuratively speaking. So, Matt, you uh, put up a most excellent post uh, yesterday on this. Uh, we're recording this on September 18th. Your post went up on September 17th entitled The Kavanaugh Compliance Lessons. And as I've been struggling through this, this matter, these facts, and where, what it all means for the compliance professional, uh, I am uh, either uh, find it uh, some very difficult issues or some very um, – uh, I don't I don't think it's troubling, but uh, why don't we just kind of start off with uh, and use your format of what do you see around investigative protocols raised by this issue? Well, yeah. So what I thought was interesting is, um, you know, not so much to dissect the Kavanaugh Ford case itself, because all that's going to do is just show off how politically astute we are. But more for corporate compliance officers, what are the big kind of lessons we could glean from how this has been emerging. And I think one is just that this case is a good reminder of how investigations should work and what evidence you might need to assess credibility, especially in cases like this, where it's personal misconduct that might have happened long ago. And there's not going to necessarily be a whole lot of documentary evidence there. Um, Now, we should make clear that as of right now, Tuesday morning, and this is a fast moving story, so who knows when it might get outdated, but as of today, uh, Brett Kavanaugh has uh, said that these st- these allegations against him are flat out false. Um, he has that right to defend himself, and if they are false, he has a right to say they are flat out false. Um, but what strikes me is that he might also simply have no recollection of meeting or assaulting forward. Um, and, you know, I think that is something that is worth considering around allegations like this is that um, Kavanaugh and Ford, both in their own heads, they could both be right at the same time. As in, Kavanaugh might actually have no recollection of something he did. And let's remember, he was accused of doing this long ago while he was stone drunk. And he has over history and emails and speeches and whatnot, talked often about how he led a somewhat wild party life when he was younger. You can, a man can do something like this, have no recollection of it, think that he is totally innocent, have no idea that what he did actually was also a defining moment in the victim's life. Um, And you will often hear that from rape victims, sexual assault victims, that they can vividly recall all sorts of specific details because the moment is seared in their head. And therefore, you could have this scenario where Ford is correct that he did this, you know, and she might think it, it might be true. Kavanaugh might also think that I didn't do this and he might believe it's true and it may be true. We don't know. But 
um, it is a very delicate situation that requires you really to think about how would you handle that? How much benefit of the doubt can you give to the accused, who is supposed to get the benefit of the doubt first, and to the accuser, who may actually also be very right in saying so-and-so did this to me, and I can recall all these details. It is worth remembering as well, and this is where it gets even more sticky, is that there's plenty of documentation about the faultiness of human memory. Um, there are many cases of people who have been sentenced to prison for sexual assault or murder or other violent crime, and then many years later, uh, DNA pro evidence has proven that they didn't do it, and that is an example. I can remember when I was a police reporter, I once wrote about the exoneration of a convicted murderer who went to prison on the testimony of eight eyewitnesses who were absolutely convinced this man did it. And then DNA evidence came out later on saying he didn't do it. Somebody else had done it. Um, so we have no idea who is or is not correct here, who might be remembering things rightly or wrongly. But you have to start from the assumption that both people might be right at the same time. And it therefore puts a, a big, big emphasis on what sort of supplementary evidence might you be able to get. So before we move to kind of the next area on evaluating redemption, Matt, one of the things that has troubled me uh, in this process has been initially there was a large number of women who supported Judge Kavanaugh's uh, nomination. I think the number of, uh, was 60. Mm -hmm. And so I've been struggling with the issue of how do you balance out the evidence? Is it one against 60? Is is one enough? Is it something more towards 50-50? Uh, we certainly have heard um, in the political arena uh, this raised. And how, as a compliance practitioner, uh, can you begin to evaluate uh, something along the, those lines? Well, I think it. You, you'd also then have to think about what type of evidence do I have? Not necessarily how much of that type of evidence, but what types of evidence do I have? Um, yes, Brad Kavanaugh had a letter from actually it was 65 women who attested to his very thoughtful and respectful approach to women. And that came out in, I think, last, sometime last week. Uh, on the other hand, uh, Christine Ford has therapy notes from 2012 where she specifically, I talked about her sexual assault, specifically naming Brett Kavanaugh in the presence of her therapist, in the presence of her husband. Uh, reportedly, she had talked about being a victim of assault without naming Kavanaugh, but as a victim of assault in earlier therapy sessions in 2002. So really, are we thinking that she's part of some long-term democratic subversive plot against Brett Kavanaugh for the last six years? before anybody ever thought he might wind up on the court, let's you know lay some groundwork to sandbag him now. That seems very far-fetched to me. Her evidence there, those therapy notes, that counts for a lot in my book. Um, and you know, going back to uh, say, you know the how many witness char character witnesses are enough? Well, go back to the the murder exoneration that I just talked about. Those eight witnesses, yeah, that was a lot of evidence. However, it didn't hold up one bit to hard DNA evidence that showed that murder suspect hadn't actually done it. Um, you have to think about what is the concrete evidence that really can't easily be refuted versus character witnesses, which, you know, maybe Brett Kavanaugh is a great guy now. I'm not sure. Um, but all the character witnesses in the world can't necessarily equal one very particular piece of concrete evidence. And I don't know how concrete those therapy notes from 2012 are, but they're a whole lot more concrete than people just saying Brett Kavanaugh is a nice guy. So now let's move to uh, the second point you raise in your blog post. And, and I suppose this is the one I have the, the most difficulty around, which is a, you entitle it evaluating redemption. Yeah. And I, um, I guess my struggle is uh, certainly uh, – We've all heard the term youthful indiscretions. Uh, I certainly engaged in some youthful indiscretions. Should a youthful indiscretion as a teenager uh, prevent you from ascending to a uh, high office, to a high position in a corporation or a high appointed position? Uh, how much redemption or remorse must you or even should you show? So how did you think through the issue of redemption or evaluating it? Well, 
with great difficulty, to be honest. But I think the point has to be raised and has to. It's a valid question to ask. You know, like at what point are some discretions in the past so far in the past, and a person has demonstrated enough growth and evolution and self-awareness that you don't necessarily need to hold those indiscretions or those offenses and misconduct against the person anymore. And uh, we all talk about this uh, in a very different context about uh, mandatory life sentences for youthful offenders, where there are many people who will say that doesn't really serve a point. Sentencing a 15-year-old or a 17-year-old to life in prison for a violent crime you know, does that really make sense when the human brain doesn't fully develop until your early 20s at least? Um, it's a valid question to raise, and it is very similar to what we have faced here. If Brett Kavanaugh did this, and that is an if, and he says he didn't, but if he did, if he had since led a very ethical, spotless life for the next 35 years, would it be valid to say maybe we shouldn't hold that against him? Now, that is a very big ask for Christine Ford, and the rest of us would be asking her to do it. We'd really, we would be imposing on her to do it. So I, I appreciate any time you talk about that, it is a very difficult thing for a harassment victim to swallow. And we should re be aware of that. But, you know, I was thinking more that, um, first off, from a procedural standpoint, if you're a compliance officer working with a board trying to investigate one of these cases, you know, you really, you should have some sense of your answer to that. How long ago is long ago? How much good action since then is enough? Answer those questions as best you can. Have a process as best you can long before any specific issue arises and you start improvising these questions on the fly which is exactly what the Senate Judiciary Committee is doing right now, and that's why this looks so ham-handed. Uh, and it is even worse because the Senate Judiciary Committee has been through this before with Anita Hill and Clarence Thomas in 1991. The chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee, Chuck Grassley, was in the Senate at that time. He saw how botched and screwed up that investigation and inquiry was, and here we are 35 years later or 25 years later from 1991, and we are recreating the same wheel in a very haphazard format again. Don't do that. If you're in the corporate world, have some sort of a thought process about how would we answer those questions because they might come up. But all of that aside, getting to the nub of the issue, how do you decide that somebody might be worth forgiving or you know excusing or whatever word you want to use? I think it really is that you want to see a change in that person's behavior. So. To get a good sense of that, you're really looking for how you can measure the, the sincerity of that person's contrition. I don't really know, but that's what you want to do. I don't, I'm not sure how you do it. But, you know, you could think through about issues of humility and empathy that the accused might show to the accuser or anybody else. You might look at actions this person has taken without any expectation of a payoff later on, that if I'm really good for 30 years, I will be able to get onto the Supreme Court later on. Can't go into it with that attitude. Um, and then, you know, I, what I don't think is that time alone is enough of a reason to let people off. You can be a jerk when you're 17 and still be a jerk when you're 53. If that shows no growth, then no, you don't necessarily need to warrant any redemption and forgiveness. Has Brett Kavanaugh grown? I'm not sure. Even then, I'm always going to say that assumes he did this, and we can't make that assumption yet. But if he did, has he grown? I'm not sure because I've seen other documentation and emails that show he kind of had youthful indiscretions well into his 30s, which doesn't show much growth to me. Maybe there are other shoes to drop out there. I'm not sure. But those are the sort of issues you have to grapple with. And it's fair to ask sometimes, could we accept this past misconduct and give this person here and now whatever they're looking for again today? Could we? Well, sometimes the answer could be yes. Sometimes it could be no. So you touched on this in uh, sort of point one, but I found the initial and continued response by Kavanaugh uh, really did not lend itself to considering whether he has engaged in redemption. And by that, I mean his response that not only did hell no, it never occurred, it never could have occurred. Yeah. Um, 
and that really, I thought, was a huge mistake uh, to start with out of the box. But he's locked himself into that position now. And I don't know how he could move to, uh, you know, I don't remember this, but if it, you know, it's horrible. And if if something like this did happen, I cannot uh, make enough amends going forward, what, whatever the response might have been. But uh, I think he's just locked into a position where we can't even evaluate uh, redemption now. Do you, or do you feel that's too strong? No, I, I think that that is an excellent point to raise. And to a certain extent, I'm very skeptical of Kavanaugh right now because I just don't get what his logic is here. Um, look, there have been plenty of times, anybody who's gone on a wild bender with drinking some night, and I've done it, Tom, you've done it, other people listening, you've done it. You wake up the next morning, you have no idea what you did. And you can't prove or disprove what other people say because you just don't remember it. Um, he could have said something like, I don't recall ever doing this. If I did it, I'm aghast. He could have apologized and all of that. And, you know, that would be a reasonable answer people would be able to entertain. I think politically it would have been the smarter one because all he's done now is say that woman is lying. And as soon as he said she's lying, well, somebody is lying. And now this hearing that is going to happen next Monday is going to be about finding out who lied. And whoever did lie, their career, their allegations, their reputations, like it's all sunk as soon as it comes out that they lied. Um, if he had said something more like, if I did this, I'm horrified, but I think I've improved enough to still warrant consideration. Frankly, I think Republicans would have seized on that anyways and, and pushed through his nomination. I Now that they can't, because he has changed this dynamic and you would have to wonder, like, why are you going on the scorched earth? It shows me that unless he really can prove or she it can be proven that she is lying and he didn't do this it doesn't show any evolvement any self-awareness any empathy for people who uh, have suffered sexual assault or anything like that i just so i'm not big on the idea that i think he is worthy of redemption unless he is completely innocent and a, a victim of a smear campaign here I, I don't know. I just I don't see that he is worthy of uh, being allowed on the court, because if he did this and didn't remember it, but this is the tactic he used. It doesn't look good for him. It doesn't reflect favorably. So, Matt, your third point, uh, which is entitled ethics of an or of the organization, I felt really uh, pointed out the differences uh, most starkly between the corporate process and the political process we're currently going through. And you rightly, I think, articulated that. Uh, both the ethics of the Senate and of the ha uh, Senate Judiciary Committee are uh, completely um, nullified at this point. So we can <laughs> uh, we could perhaps leave that uh, to another this, another day. But it, you do point out, I think, correctly and even more importantly, that it's the ethics within the organization which are going to drive the process. So maybe you could unpack that a little for us. Yeah, you know, it because. It, Really, the, the Senate and particularly Republicans in Washington these days, they have kind of shown that they don't really have many ethics. Uh, they don't abide by many principles. If a principle or a past customary tradition gets in the way, Mitch McConnell is perfectly content to chuck it out the window. I know plenty of listeners will say so are Democrats. You know what? They're not the ones who are running this show right now. The ones who are running the show are the Republicans. And the fact is that they have surrendered the moral high ground on Supreme Court nominations. So it becomes very hard for them to have any legitimacy when talking about maybe Kavanaugh did this, even if he did do it, he's grown, let's redeem him, let's forgive him, and let's give him this anyways. You can't be a legitimate arbiter of forgiveness and redemption if you have surrendered the moral high ground before. And it really then gets down to, yet again, does the organization have leaders who embody and uphold the ethical principles the organization supposedly has. Supposedly, the Senate is a very high-minded and ethical place. In reality, its leaders are nowhere near that. And because of that, uh, you can't really say that Kavanaugh is necessarily going to get a fair hearing either way. Even if he gets onto the Supreme Court, it's going to come across to many people as the raw exercise of power which is not the same as a fair and impartial investigation and a thoughtful decision based on ethical principles. It's not, that is not going to happen with 
the Kavanaugh case. Either Kavanaugh is going to implode because of some other allegation that blows up, or the Senate is going to ram him through simply because they can and they want to. And that is not a good way for an organization to conduct itself, but we've talked about that in Washington many times already, and we will for many more, I'm sure. So there, one of uh, the pieces I read on this was by Mark Joseph Stern, uh, writing in Slate, and he raised a point that I thought really had uh, some uh, applicability both in the political realm and in the, the corporate realm. And he said that uh, to ascertain whether Kavanaugh has earned the senator's vote, they should not ask if he committed assault as a teenager. They must also decide whether the nominee is being truthful today. Under these circumstances, evasion is unacceptable and any attempt at dissimulation should be rejected. And I guess, Matt, why that struck me is so applicable to the corporate world is that if you are faced with a similar situation in the corporate world and the person being investigated does engage in evasion, does engage in dissimulation, I think that would uh, also disqualify them because of the importance of those uh, simply in doing business and doing business uh, in compliance, doing business ethically and doing business with a value set that uh, says we're not going to break laws going forward. I I agree with all of that. Um, It's worth noting that like 20 or 30 years ago when these cases would erupt in the corporate realm, um, organizations could evade all of that because you could just buy somebody off, you could fire them, you could retaliate against them, you could give them a non-disclosure agreement and a settlement, and this goes away. And it is kind of what I just talked about. Like they had the ability to do the raw exercise of power against someone trying to hold a powerful man accountable for misconduct. Um, It is a good thing that that dynamic has changed and that companies, I think, can't do that very easily anymore. And I think a lot of large companies no longer even want to do it anymore. Um, It's a step in the right direction. It is probably a step above where the U.S. Senate is these days. But, um, you know, just. It, I, I agree with what that person said. So, Matt, this has really been an interesting uh, exploration. I, I will have to say that I'm not sure I'm any less troubled or disconcerted than I was when we started, but at least we were able to talk some, some of these issues out. Yeah. Thank you very much, Tom. All right. We will uh, continue to watch this. For Matt Kelly, this is Tom Fox on uh, Compliance Into the Weeds. Thank you for listening. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox again. I'd like to thank you for listening to this episode of Compliance Into the Weeds. If you have any questions, you can email me at tfox at tfoxlaw.com. You can email Matt at mkelly at radicalcompliance.com. Thank you again for joining us this week, and I hope you'll join us again next week when Matt and I take another deep dive, literally going into the compliance weeds. Compliance Into the Weeds is a part of the Compliance Podcast Network.